Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hanging on to Hope podcast. I'm Brenda J. And I'm Karen Wonder. And we are HangingOnToHope.org. This podcast is intended as educational and is not psychological or medical advice. Always consult a professional when needed, and we disclaim any liability in connection with the instruction, information, or advice given. It's funny. I tell people that before I was known as the abuse guy, I was the freedom guy for years before that. Mm. And so all of a sudden, there's there's probably more people that know me as the abuse advocate than that know me as the freedom guy. Mm. And that's weird because I spent like, you know, 20 years developing my freedom concepts and, you know, helping people implement them literally around the world. I get what you're saying. The freedom is like, wow. Like there's just no, there's nothing better. Yeah. Really. It all goes together. It all goes together. It has to. Otherwise we just become so focused on the problem. It consumes us. Mm -hmm. Well, hi everyone. This is Karen W. And we thank you for tuning into the hanging on to hope podcast. Today we have Bob Hamp on the podcast. Bob is a counselor and the founder of the Think Differently Counseling, Consulting, and Connecting Center. He has been in private practice and worked in the church for a combined 30 years of practice. Besides his service of private practice and organizational consulting, he spent 10 years developing a group discipleship strategy called Freedom Ministry that helped thousands of people find freedom from a broad range of struggles. When I listened to his teaching on his Think Differently Academy on the subject of understanding abuse, it was one of the most validating moments of my life. So I'm so excited to introduce our listeners to this resource. So welcome to the show, Bob. Well, thank you guys. I'm very happy to be here. Yes, we're, we're thankful for you to yes, be here. Yes, we are. So we always start out learning a little bit about the background of our guests. So we'd love to, if you could just tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to found the Think Differently Academy. So there's a short version and a long version. I'm going to try to stick on the short version of that. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and have been for 30 years. I'm also a believer and have been for slightly longer than that. And somewhere back in the 90s, when I started my counseling practice, it feels so weird saying back in the 90s, but... (laughs) Somewhere back in the 90s when I started my counseling practice, I was also teaching live classes in a number of different settings. And it seemed that those classes were always so helpful to people and and always kind of seemed to draw people. And so I've I've almost constantly taught somewhere, whether I've taught in a church setting, when we opened up Think Differently Counseling, Consulting, and Connecting, we opened up the lobby once a week and taught live from here. And we started to broadcast it on Facebook Live. And it turned out that we had way more people viewing on Facebook Live than we did gathered in our small classroom. Mm. And then we started to realize we had, over the years, gathered years of content from these classes. And I'm just going to say, we started to have less and less faith in the social media platforms to continue to carry our content or to continue to allow us to access our own content. And so about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, we decided that we should move our content off of the primary social media platforms and onto our own platform. So a lot of people aren't aware of Think Differently Academy. This year, we finally completed the element of it that's actually a social media platform itself. So members of the Academy can come on and make a profile just as if you were on Facebook or Twitter or something like that. And not only can they make a profile and interact with each other, but it allows them then to access all the content in varying levels of accessibility. We are aware in our counseling practice that even with all the counselors we link arms with, we're still not able to meet all the needs that are out there. There's a lot of people who may not come into a counseling practice. There's a lot of people who may not even realize they would be helped by it, but they might click on a class somewhere and realize that there's something they've struggled with that they could be helped with. And so the Think Differently Academy was developed as a way really to make available to people literally around the world at this point help with a variety of different things like relationship struggles, abuse, as you guys have mentioned, personal freedom, communication issues, addiction, codependency, all those different things. And so we offer, I've lost track of the number of hours, but we lo- we offer all those resources on Think Differently Academy as a way to help people who might not ever come into a counseling office. 
Yeah, that's great. And I think that's where I think that's where I first saw you was on Facebook. That's where I saw that teaching that we're going to draw from. But I love that how you've got it all gathered together in one place now, because it definitely makes it a lot more easy to find certain subjects. So that's great. Wow, this is so great for our listeners to know that, that you're out there. This yeah, is amazing. Such a great resource. So on the teaching of understanding abuse, you start out with focusing on the story in the Bible of the woman caught in adultery and how, how she was dragged down the street and thrown at Jesus to try to trap him. The beautiful thing that happens in that passage is that Jesus took what you call the toxic triangle of the men in that story that were trying to put the weight of their agenda on this woman, using her plight to trap Jesus in some religious way. But Jesus decided who rightly should handle the responsibility at that moment, and it was not the accused woman. In the end, she was told by Jesus, where are your accusers? I don't accuse you either. This is the introduction to understanding abuse and that you say at the core of abuse is the inappropriate assignment of responsibility and how deadly it can be to wrongly assign responsibility. You say it is the foundation of destructive behaviors. Can you expound on that imbalance of responsibility concept? Well, we could talk about that for the entire podcast. (laughs) Yes, we could. (laughs) when, When I did that teaching four and a half years ago, I didn't know that I was opening up a whole new venue. Well, people have literally come out of the woodwork. You know, Karen, you talked about it being so validating for you. We've literally had people contact us over the last four years and say, that teaching helped me finally understand and get out of a dangerous situation and into safety. And so when talking about that misassignment of responsibility, I, I'll expound on that as long as you guys will let me. But let me let me give kind of the, the foundation of it and then talk about, then I want to zoom in and give an example so people can see. Because a lot of times when you think about the inappropriate assignment of responsibility, it doesn't sound all that wicked. It sounds like a bad thing, but it doesn't sound like a, a lethal thing. So let me let me back up and say, psychologically speaking, the movement towards mental, emotional, and spiritual health comes in the, the movement of the soul from dependency to independence. Mm-hmm. So dependent is a child who parents manage his life, grandparents manage his life, even sometimes older siblings, not just manage their life in terms of food and clothing, but also sometimes, you know, a child doesn't know how to manage their own emotions and the parents will help them, you know, a healthy parent will help them learn how to manage an emotional state, may even provide comfort when a child doesn't know how to comfort themselves. And so over a lifetime, And this isn't like the development of the body that's just chronological in nature. Some people live an entire lifetime of dependency, but independence is essentially the idea that I can manage my own soul. I'm in charge of my thoughts. I'm in charge of my emotional state. Nobody else is responsible for how I feel in this moment. And so that movement from everybody else is responsible for me to I'm 100% responsible to me is the foundation of, like I said, mental, emotional, spiritual, and relational health. And so you can see just from that, that when we misassign responsibility, we maintain dysfunction, not only in the process of the relationship, but in all the participants in the relationship. But let's zoom in. Let me give an example of what this looks like in a specific situation so people can hear just how devastating this is. So I'm going to take what I think is the most concrete form of abuse, because a lot of times the the kinds of abuse that I end up working with are subtle and almost invisible. I call it hidden in plain sight. I'm going to take the most concrete type of abuse, which would be sexual abuse from an adult to a child. And I want to give four steps of the inappropriate transfer of responsibility so people can really see just how devastating this is. Number one, let's say that an adult male sexually abuses a child who's female. The first transfer of responsibility is he makes a child responsible for his drives. By imposing his sexual behavior on a child who has no responsibility, he's made the covert statement to her that you're responsible to handle my sexual sexual drives and my sexual behavior. So the next step is, in most, if not all cases, the abuser will say to the child something like this, I'm doing this to you because you're bad, or I'm doing this to you because you're good, or I'm doing this to you because you're pretty, or I'm doing this to you because you're ugly. Whatever the statement might be, the second assignment of responsibility is now the child is responsible for the person's inappropriate choice. So you're responsible to handle my sexual drive, but now you're also responsible for what I'm doing to you. Now, the third thing comes along when the person turns to them and says, now that I've done this, if you tell somebody, I will hurt you or I'll hurt somebody you care, all of a sudden, the child who should have been protected is responsible for protecting the adult who harmed them. And you can see in just three quick steps 
what happens is that inappropriate assignment of responsibility leaves a very young child carrying an overwhelming weight of pain and confusion and fear and all the other things that are woven into that. Now, let me mention the fourth step. I told you there can be a long and a short version of this, but this fourth step, I think, is important for the conversation. The fourth step is, let's say that child gets up the courage to tell. They go to a school counselor or a parent, and they tell. And sadly, in eight out of 10 cases, and that's that's observation, That's I'm not quoting a research study at that point, but eight out of 10 cases, the adult will turn to the child and say, yeah, but what were you doing? What was your responsibility? What were you wearing? What how, what were you doing that they would have treated you that way? Okay. And now not only has the abuser transferred responsibility, but the third party, the onlooker, whether it be a parent, but somebody who should protect the child asks a simple question. It might even be stated this way. Were you doing anything that might have caused that to happen? In a child's mind, they immediately hear, it's my fault. Yeah. In four quick steps, that child has been assigned responsibility. And if it's chronic in their life, they grow up believing that they're responsible for everybody around them. Yeah, Hmm. that's huge. That's so incredibly damaging. Wow. When you explain it like that, for sure. And it also shapes their belief system about how they fit into the world. Mm -hmm. They begin to believe their place in life is to carry other people's burdens, to carry other people's inappropriate behaviors. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So now I'm, I am, I'm glad I get to listen to this many, many times and <laughs> process it over and over again, because that's a lot to take in. It, it's a lot, but it's, and think about what, you know, this is us listening to this as adults. Imagine being a child living through it. Right. And is it, is it similar, even not in a sexual abuse case? Like I was abused in my marriage and I took on, I took responsibility for all that too. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's the it, same for any abuse. Every yeah. single form of abuse wow. has, has its foundation, the inappropriate assignment of responsibility. Yeah. I had that inappropriate assignment. You're always making up excuses and think about the responsible uh, for that behavior. The person who's violent with their spouse and says, I wouldn't do this if you would put dinner on the table. Right. They mm-hmm. blame everything on you. Yes. Right. We're going to get and into that. That, that blame, that language of blame is simply the vehicle by which they transfer responsibility. I wouldn't be so rough on you if you would give me more sex. And on and on, the constant methodology is, and, and there's two sides to it. I want you to make sure make your sure your listeners hear both sides. There's the abuser transferring their responsibility, but there's also the abuser demanding the resource of the victim. So the victim has something that the abuser wants, whether it be their body, whether it be their service, whether it be their attention. The victim has something the abuser wants. And they demand the resource in exchange for the person taking on the responsibility for the defect. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, that kind of hit home on that one. So we'll go ahead and move on so I can listen to that one over and over again and process (laughs) that one as we go on. You talk about how abusive relationships usually have a mutually dependent relationship, and this can be covert or overt. But there's a dynamic that is easy to not be consciously aware of, which is why it is important to talk about and hopefully can give some validation and insight to our listeners that may be in an unhealthy relationship. Can you explain how that mutual aspect is part of the dynamic, even if it's unconscious? I will do that. And I want to give a quick caveat. Because even in that first teaching four and a half years ago, I had some pushback from some people who were right. Even though there's a mutual dependency, one of the things I think I said in that early teaching is that there's a a covert agreement. And I want to make a distinction between those two things. Perhaps in the adult relationship, there's a covert agreement, but in the adult to child relationship, there's a covert dependency. And the dependency is the abuser wants something from the victim. And so they put themselves in the hand of the victim. Like I said, they either want sexual favors, they want, you know, service of some sort. They want to, you know, that person to be able to carry the blame for their addiction, their their compulsivity, whatever it might be. So they want something from the victim, but the victim also wants something from the abuser. Otherwise they wouldn't stay. If you're a child abused by an adult in your life, you want to be protected and taken care of. And so a child finds himself trying to meet the needs of the parent, hoping it will provide safety for them in the long run, or even hoping it will provide acceptance or love or whatever it is they're trying to get. So the dependency is the victim wants something that might even be 
appropriate in a healthy relationship. They want protection. They want provision. They want care. They want love. They want acceptance. And the abuser has something they want. Again, I've, you know, I've named those a few times. And so kind of the mutual dependency is they both hang on wanting to get what they want to get out of the relationship. Mm. Yeah. And well, we get into that, I think, a little bit more as we go through, because, yeah, that really yeah. validated me because I never had really thought about that. I think aspect. for me, it was a false sense of security. It wasn't really real. It for sure. False reality and that false sense of security that I think I was wanting from my abuser. And I have said this in a couple of different settings. I don't know if you, I, I know that I didn't say it in the teaching that you guys are quoting. I'm a marriage and family therapist by training. And so I think systemically, but the reason that I learned this particular teaching is that I got out of a 30 year abusive relationship wow. after six different counselors told me I was being abused and I didn't believe it. Oh, wow. Hmm. And so years. I was wow. trying to, trying to be helpful and trying to fix something that I felt like I had the capability to fix. And so we had kind of this covert agreement that I would work on things and the other party in the relationship would take things. Yeah. Yeah. And that dynamic for a man is so much more difficult because you have to be strong and tough and, you know, your whole role is different. So it's harder for you to definitely admit that you're being abused. Yeah, it's still difficult wow. sometimes to just say that out loud. Yeah. Uh, however, you know, I've found like we all have when we tell our story that there's power for all of us kind of as a fabric that, you know, when, when we can look at each other and say, you know, hashtag me too, right. there's some power for us to come together in that. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's why you can probably explain it so well, because I, you know, I never really thought about, wow, how did you get to the point where you could explain it so well, but probably because you lived it, you were able to really see that dynamic. So you say that in abusive relationships, there is one usually called an abuser that utilizes the position of power and dispels responsibility, kind of like we were saying, to carry the weight of their sin and responsibility. And the other person in the relationship, usually called the victim, they take everything on the abuser hands them and it actually soothes their own fear because they see the abuser as someone who needs healing and the victim's nurturing personality is prone to be a helper. So they think they can be instrumental in helping, but it usually does not turn out that way. So you used a drawing board and you just simply drew two circles on the board, on the whiteboard, and you had pluses in one circle and minuses in the other. And you were using that whole, you know, just that simple dynamic to show how that, to me, that really hit home that you can't sustain that when you're constantly, if you're the victim and you're constantly carrying the bearing of the whole relationship on you, or at least a big part of it, that can't be sustained. You get worn out. So that was really validating. And even just seeing that simple drawing was really helpful for me. And you drew arrows, you know, and we're kind of explaining the whole process. So can you discuss why this imbalance cannot be sustained? Sure. I, I want to say before I answer that question, the more that I've placed my feet in this space where people come talking about their own abuse experience or recognizing maybe for the first time their own abuse experience, the question that often comes up because they've gotten to that point where they can't sustain it. And finally, they're talking about it in a way of maybe willing to call it abuse for the first time. And they find themselves kind of in this wash of shame where they go, what's wrong with me that this happened to me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did I do that, that made me either deserve this or that, that, you know, what did I do that made this happen? And I want to address that for a second on my way to answering why it can't be sustained. Yeah. What I tell people in that setting is abuse doesn't happen to you because of something wrong with you. It happens because of something right with you. Oh, the wow. abuse victims that I know and have worked with over these years are all generous, kind, thoughtful they're patient, they're willing to be long suffering and their generosity and, and strength of character and the depth of their willingness to love and give is profound. Mm -hmm. And yet it is that very thing that an abusive personality feasts on. And so those characteristics in healthy relationships, those characteristics in cultural or social settings are beautiful and powerful characteristics. But when a predator sees those characteristics, it's a magnetic draw for that predator to come and say, here's somebody who's generous, kind, and willing to be long suffering. Yeah. But here's the answer to your question then. Why can it not go on? Well, in the two circles that you described, the abuser has minuses in their circle because they've got emotional deficits. 
the victim has pluses in their circle because they have resource. Like I mentioned earlier, whether the resource is uh, sexuality, whether the resource is service, whether the resource is you know, the willingness to take blame or the willingness to carry weight. But here's what happens. Think about this for a second. How long can you drive your car without stopping at a gas station or in today's world without stopping to plug it in? Yeah, not forever. I mean, it's not something you can just do limitless. There comes a point where you can no longer bear up under carrying someone else's responsibility and giving away all of your resource. Almost literally, your emotional tank begins to dry up. And usually what I see happen is the abuse victim has been saying for a while, hey, something's got to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the tank runs out. Yes. And they say, you know, no, the thing that needs to change, I'm out of here. Now the abuser realizes that they're losing their supply. They're losing where they've gotten all their resource. So they'll come back and say, can't we work this out? They start what's called hoovering in the abuse advocacy community. Hoovering is trying to suck someone back into a dynamic. And if that person's really come to the end because their tank is completely dry, all the hoovering in the world can't pull them back. Right. But the reason that it can't be sustained is nobody can drive on an empty tank. Right. Yeah, that's very well said. Yeah, what, what you said before, I felt like it was just God speaking truth. I I was telling my friend that last night after our prayer meeting, like, it's not a bad thing that we're good people. I mean, they took advantage of us because of our, the good qualities in us. And then you just said that and it just hit me so hard. Yeah. So it's uh, dead on. Yeah. So you explain the mindset of an abuser and that they see themselves as having a little problem that they think turns into a big problem because the victim does not act, do or feel like they want. Therefore, they blame the victim as they see them as the problem. It becomes an ongoing pattern of behavior and the mutual dynamic of the relationship. Can you share some of the experiences you have had seeing this dynamic? Yeah, you know, the sad part about that is... Brenda, not only does the abuser sometimes do that, see the other person as the problem, but sometimes the helpers do too. Yeah. A helper who's not familiar with this dynamic of abuse, and one of the reasons it's so important to define it as the misassignment of responsibility is because a lot of helpers, even licensed counselors like myself, think of abuse as a set of behaviors you can do away with the behaviors and still be blaming the other person. And it's, that sounds something like this. Hey, I stopped drinking. When are you going to forgive me? Yeah. I stopped beating you. When are you going to let go of that? That is actually an inappropriate assignment of responsibility because what they're saying is, I treated you badly for decades. I stopped yesterday. You're responsible to make up for those decades. Hmm. Yeah, just get wow. over it. So now when let's say a counselor, secular or Christian, takes up that same cause. And sadly, we see it a lot in the Christian counseling world because there's this sense that forgiveness should be the next automatic step. Right. And forgiveness defined wrongly means you look over the other person's behavior or sin as if it didn't happen. Yeah, that's what I did for years. And the reality is forgiveness is for the healing of your soul, mm -hmm. but you can still hang on to healthy boundaries. You, you can still separate relationship and be forgiving. If you separate or divorce somebody who's abusing you, that's not an indicator of unforgiveness. That's an indicator of the other person's lack of safety. Mm -hmm. And so the subtle kind of blaming the other person or transferring the responsibility to them is not just about, hey, give me what I want, but it's also about, so I've stopped the bad behavior. Now you owe me forgiveness. Now that I've stopped pressuring you for sex, maybe you'll give me sex. Well, wait, isn't that another form of pressure? And so again, we see it from both the abuser, but also then from some helpers who may step in and say, well, you know, can't you see that they've been trying hard? Why don't you give them a chance? Is actually picking up the, the mantle of continuing to assign responsibility to the victim. Here's the tricky part. For change to happen, and again, this is why it's so important to define this as the misassignment of responsibility. For change to happen, both people would have to stop what they're doing. And what the abuser's doing wrong isn't just drinking, beating the other person, sexually abusing them. What the abuser's doing wrong is they're making them responsible for, for things. So they would have to not only stop the behavior, but they would have to publicly 
take responsibility for their choices and behaviors and do so with both empathy and responsibility over months worth of time. Yeah. So it's not just a matter of stopping the behavior. It's a matter of taking responsibility. The reason I say publicly is because often the transfer of responsibility has been public. You know, my, my wife has been doing this for so long. If only she would blank, blank, blank. Um, and you've got counselors and pastors and friends who are going, oh, Susie, can't you just give him what he's asking for? I mean, he's really changed, right? Right. Mm-hmm. But here's the other side of it. For the victim to change, they actually have to stop accepting responsibility. Right. Yeah, boundaries. That's our boundaries. That's the tricky part because those in the Christian world often think, oh, you're bitter. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We did a whole podcast kind of talking about that. Yeah. It, It sounds like, hey, he has to work on some things. I'm not going to bail him out anymore. Right. He's got to take care of some business that I'm not responsible for. And everybody that's looking on, I shouldn't say everybody, many people that are looking on still want the victim to take on the responsibility for that. Yeah. Like you're saying, especially in the counseling world. I don't think I was able to fully stop taking on responsibility till I just got out and had no contact. Yeah. I think sometimes it takes that. Clearly. Yeah. Like I couldn't see clearly. Now I'm like, I wasn't responsible for any of that. Yeah. Yeah, I I think sometimes it takes getting out because there's such a fog Yes, oh, there's yeah. a fog. There's such an emotional fog around it that, like I said, I had six different counselors telling me that I was being abused. And I told them, all six of them, that they were wrong. Wow. That's yeah. Quote, unquote, they just didn't understand. Wow. wow. <laughs> Turns out I was the one who didn't understand. Right. But now you do. And now you're explaining it so other people can And there is a big learn. fog until you get out and then you start to see more clearly. Yeah. The fog has to start lifting. Yeah. When the fog lifts, all of a sudden you can see with clearly where the road really is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting that you say that the person who is the least invested in the relationship has the most power. The person invested in the relationship, say a Christian wife, has usually tried everything, like you were saying, they know of to help the relationship because it's deeply important to them. And this leaves them in a powerless position. The power comes from not caring and seeing the other person responsible. This explains the madness that is felt in this type of relationship. And this was another thing that was extremely validating to me. So anything you want to expound on that with that power dynamic? Oh my, yeah. So that's called the principle of least interest. It's actually from way back in the 30s. A sociologist named uh, Willard Waller wrote a book and used that phrase after doing some research about that. The principle of least interest is exactly what you said, and that is the person who's least invested in the relationship has the most power in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So as a marriage counselor, and I have been one for 30 years, one of the dynamics that I have to always evaluate in a marriage, even when abuse isn't the issue, one of the dynamics I have to evaluate is who's got power and or who doesn't have power. So in a healthy marriage, both partners should have the right to ask for their needs to be responded to. Both should have the right to talk about something that makes them, you know, that's either hurtful or or frustrating for them. Both people should have the right to ask for change and both people should have equal rights to ask for things in the relationship. And anytime one person has more power than the other, that begins to create an unhealthy dynamic in the marriage. You can't have intimacy with someone who has power over you because intimacy in itself implies chosen vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And if someone has power over you, you can't choose vulnerability. It's been forced on you. Mm. And so this principle of least interest, one of the things that happens is in every abuse dynamic, one of the issues is a power differential. But to assign responsibility to somebody, you've got to have the authority to assign responsibility, which means you've got to have the power to create the narrative. So the narrative here is, she's just not doing enough for me. And if my pastor would agree with that, maybe the two of us could put pressure on her to do enough. Well, you've got to have the power to do that. Yeah. And a significant part of that power comes from this idea that they're just not as invested in the relationship. Let me go back to what I said about abuse victims become victims because of what's good about them, not because of what's bad about them. And one of the things that's good about every abuse victim I've ever worked with is they are deeply invested in making their relationships work. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah. the problem is you can't make a relationship work with someone who's deeply invested in controlling you. Yes. Right. Very, that's very well said. Right. And I didn't even realize till I got out that it was all about con- him trying to control. It's all about control. I was getting hit because he didn't have control. Yeah. 
So you give some insight that many victims may have been brought up in a home where the parent or parents put the weight of emotional responsibility on them as a child unknowingly. They learned early on to carry the responsibility of someone else, and this naturally leads to a potential abusive relationship pattern. They may not have had their own emotions validated. Can you explain how this sets them up for abuse? Yeah, you know, I mentioned when I went through the four steps of assigning responsibility in the sexual abuse scenario that I talked about, and I even kind of referenced that thought in that four-step scenario. To be continued, stay tuned for next week's part two of Understanding the Dynamics of Abuse with Bob Hamp. You don't want to miss it. Thanks for tuning in to Hanging on to Hope. Check out our website, hangingontohope.org. There are resources on there, and if you would like to donate or volunteer, you can do that through our website. We are a brand new nonprofit, so we appreciate any and all support. And we thank you for listening. And until next time, keep hanging on to hope. We are evidence that there is hope and healing for you. And our passion is to help you find it too. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening, everyone.